The black wave that started in the aftermath of the year 1979 was very visible in the way it unfolded across the region. It involved the spread of the Shia style chador, the black all enveloping cloak that spread out of um, revolutionary Iran into communities like the Shia community in Lebanon. It was present of course before, but it became a lot more dominant. And from Saudi Arabia came the Saudi style niqab, um, the, the face veil and the black abaya and even the black gloves for women, which spread to places like Egypt, where it had never been seen before. And it enveloped even uh, Egyptian actresses who had been on screen before with bare hair in skirts and shirts and had decided in the night and then decided in the 90s to um, veil and wear the, the niqab. And that's why the type, that's where the title of the book comes from because the Egyptian cinema director Yusuf Shaheen in the 90s described this as a black wave. And beyond the way it changed the appearance of many women, not all of course, but many women, um, there's also the black flags of mourning for Imam Hussein in Shia communities, which had always been there, but became even more prevalent, even more widespread, all the way up to more recently, the black flags of, of ISIS. But when I use the term black wave, I'm also talking about the rise of intolerance the black wave that darkens our minds, closes our minds, not just talking about religious fundamentalism. Writing nonfiction about complex subjects like the Middle East, the history of the Middle East, can turn into a very dense book. And I wanted Black Wave to be accessible to as wide an audience as possible. And the best way to do that is to tell the story through the lives of people. And so I describe Black Wave as the 1001 nights of modern Middle Eastern politics, because in each chapter, um, there is a character in each country, and I tell the story of their lives and how it's been appended by the geopolitics playing in the background. It is about the geopolitics, it is about the rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia, but it is also about these amazing characters from Pakistan, where we have the television anchor Mehta Barashti, who stands up to the dictator Ziyal Haq, to Syria and the Syrian intellectual Yasin al Haj Saleh, who stands up to dictatorship there, uh, to um, characters like Jamal Khashoggi, of course, in Saudi Arabia, who ends up paying with his life in his fight against the darkness. These characters, their lives help tell um, a story and help make the story of the region much more accessible to a wide audience. I thought it was also very important to tell the story of people to humanize this region, which has been reduced to headlines about dictators and terrorists. I wanted to show the face, the lives, the details of the people who live here, particularly because it is the story of people who have been fighting back against the darkness. And they're not a minority. I really do believe that my characters represent a majority a majority that has paid a very heavy price, that has sometimes had to stay silent, but it is really representative of the diversity in this region. My characters are Sunni and Shia, they're men and women, they're Arab and Iranian, and I have characters, as I mentioned, all the way to Pakistan. So it's really about humanizing a region. There are always many turning points in, in a region's history or in world history, and there have been other turning points in the Middle East, from the Six-Day War in 1967, to the creation of Israel in 1948, to the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. But what I found was particularly specific to 1979 was that the changes that it ushered in 
were not just geopolitical, the way other turning points do. Uh, the changes that it ushered in were also cultural and social. Because what happened were, in essence, three events. The Iranian Revolution uh, in 1979, which brought, back, brought Khomeini uh, back to, to Iran and turned the Persian Kingdom into an Islamic Republic. The siege of the Holy Mosque in Mecca, which unleashed Wahhabism in a way and made the Saudi royals much more willing to export their brand of, of Islam, their, their understanding of Islam outside of their borders, and then the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Those three events were at the onset unconnected, unrelated, but they become irre irrevocably intertwined and they unleash the Saudi-Iran rivalry, which is the geopolitical part of this story. Those two countries, which were friendly rivals before, friendly competitors, allies in many ways, and the twin, um, twin pillars of US policy in the region, these two countries become mortal enemies. And they start fighting each other for hegemony in the region, not just on a geopolitical level, but on a cultural and social level. And the changes that they unleash, the way they export their understanding of Shia-led Islam or Saudi, uh, led Sunni um, Islam changes the way people in countries around, around the region begin to understand their religion and their culture. And that's why I say that 1979 is so crucial and that the events of that year end up changing our collective memory. And so I'll just add one more point, which is it's, it's noteworthy to remember that the Iranian revolution did not start out as an Islamic revolution. It became an Islamic revolution. But at the onset, it was a leftist nationalist movement against a king. And it was seen by many as, as that. Uh, the, left, the international left was fighting everywhere against dictatorship, against imperialism from Angola to Vietnam. Um, this was the era of the left, the era of the hippies. And we forget that sometimes. We forget that political Islam was not a power yet. And I think that that is what the crucial impact of 1979 is as well. The rise of political Islam as a real political force and the rise of religious fundamentalism. You have several generations who have now lived and grown up in the darkness that was unleashed in 1979, in the shadow of the events of that year. You have those who were born before, but who were still shaped by the events after in 1979 and after. Young adults before 1979 whose lives were changed and who saw in front of them how the region transformed, and who perhaps did not at first recognize the slow creep of the change in freedoms, the shift in values and references, but who 40 years later look back and ask what happened to us. And you have those who were born in 1979 and who are a product of that year, who have known nothing really but the impact of the events of 1979. I think, for example, of Sufana Dahlan, a good friend of mine uh, born around that year in Saudi Arabia, who grows up in the darkness of the 80s and the 90s in the kingdom when a kingdom that was always conservative becomes even more conservative, where freedoms are ever more restricted. She grows up in the province of Hejaz. She grows up with parents who are open-minded, who understand how to navigate the different worlds between what is allowed and not allowed at home and outside, those contradictions that are very hard for a child to understand. And then I think, for example, of the 9-11 hijackers who it so turns out to be, and we must remember that 15 of the 19 were Saudis, I was interested to realize that most of them were born around the year 1979. So they too were a product of that darkness that engulfed us. They were both victims 
and, and perpetrators. And so when I look around me in, in the region, I see a lot of people who've been shaped by the events who are Generation 1979. But I think it's also important to note that Generation 1979 is tired of being hostage of that year. And that's why we see continued protests around the region by young people, the young generation, which wants to move on. After 1979, as Iran and Saudi Arabia started turning into rivals and, and enemies, their rivalry was really about hegemony of the region. Iran wanted to export the Islamic Revolution, and in doing so, in going beyond the borders of Iran and beyond the borders of the Shia community of Iran and, and worldwide, they were undermining Saudi Arabia's role as leader of the Muslim world. And Khomeini himself, Ayatollah Khomeini, had his eyes on Mecca and Medina. And he often brought up the issue of the Saudi custodianship of the two holy sites in Islam. And that really drives the insecurity of the Saudis. That really um, undermines their sense of security in their role. So the rivalry between the two countries it is driven by a desire to dominate from a geopolitical perspective, but also from a religious and cultural perspective. And it has been the current that continues to feed this rivalry over, over time, since 1979 up until today with ups and downs, with some detente here and there, with rapprochement in the 90s. And so what I think is noteworthy today, and of course, I'll, I'll retract just a little bit to say that it has been devastating for the region because even if Saudi Arabia and Iran are not at war directly, they fight their wars by proxy, whether it's the Iran-Iraq war during the 80s, during which Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries and the United States backed Iraq, or whether it's today in Syria and Yemen, where both Iran and Saudi Arabia back proxies and have, in essence, blood on their hands in both countries. But what's different today is that unlike in the past, where it looked often possible that there could be a rapprochement, and there was a rapprochement in the 90s because of the leadership in both Iran and Saudi Arabia, I think today it's looking increasingly impossible to have anything less than minimum detente between the two countries unless there is a fundamental change of direction or leadership in either country and most, most crucially it would have to be um, Iran. The other thing that I would say is that what has changed in the nature or in the, in the configuration of the rivalry is that whereas before, both Iran and Saudi Arabia used the Palestinian cause as a way to rally the masses to their camp. Today, Saudi Arabia doesn't do that as much anymore because it is in essence in the same camp as Israel and the United States, unofficially in an unspoken way in the camp that counters um, Iran. And so that is a crucial difference with where things stood in 1979. One of my favorite untold stories that I retell at the beginning of the book in the first chapter, a forgotten episode of the Lebanese Civil War. The chaos of the Lebanese Civil War, which started in 1975, with the presence of uh, Palestinian guerrilla fighters in Lebanon, turned out to be a very um, favorable terrain for the opposition to the Shah to train. So the vanguards of the Iranian revolution were training in Lebanon, leftists, nationalists, and Islamists, and they were training in Lebanon mostly with Palestinian guerrilla fighters in Fatah. And that's why Yasser Arafat later on plays such a 
key role uh, in the story of, of the rivalry. And he goes to visit, he's the first foreign dignitary to go visit Khomeini in Tehran after Khomeini returns um, in February of 1979. But the training of Palestinian, uh, the training by Palestinian fighters of Iranians who are in the opposition and who then go back to Iran to bring down the Shah and, and fight on the streets of Tehran against the leftovers of the regime, that is a very interesting and forgotten story. And what it leads to, of course, um, because as I said, some of these um, Iranian opposition uh, uh, members were leftist and nationalists, but also Islamists. Those Islamists who eventually come out on top in Iran um, because the left is eliminated um, in, in Iran after the return of Khomeini. Those Islamists who have uh, who, who cultivated contacts in, in Lebanon and in Syria before 1979 are then those who help as they return to Lebanon and Syria, help establish Hezbollah. So the seeds of the creation of Hezbollah really precede the 1982 um, invasion by Israel of Lebanon, which is where most people place the creation of Hezbollah in reaction to the Israeli invasion. But the seeds of Hezbollah, the idea of exporting the Iranian revolution was already there. And the people who helped bring about Hezbollah had already been in Lebanon before 1979. I really wanted to put women at the heart of the story that I tell in Black Wave. And so half my characters are women and they're really incredible, they're formidable. And the reason I wanted to do that is because I wanted to show that women in the region are strong and powerful and feisty and they fight back against the darkness, against intolerance, against injustice. I wanted to show them not as victims, but as women with agency uh, who have a story and a role to play. It's true that in many ways, just as with most events that we see unfold around us, particularly today, for example, with the, um, the coronavirus crisis around the world, the impact on women stuck at home with abusive partners, it's very often the first victims are often women. And so life has changed for a lot of women in the region, whether it's with restriction on their freedoms, uh, whether it's with restrictions physically on how they have to dress in Iran, uh, whether it's on the kind of jobs they are allowed to, to have, um, whether it's on the general closing of the mind and the intolerance that we witness, the first impact is often on women. But I really would like to emphasize that the women of this region are strong, are powerful, are smart, and they fight back.